Joe of the Chalet School. Chapter 9. Shakespeareana. I'm fed up, observed Evan Dean one day shortly after Mr. Denny had made his debut at the Chalet School. I think Gisla is right down mean. Why? demanded Margia, who was sitting on the top of her desk, swinging her legs. What's she done to you? She's fined me. Oh, why? Was it slaying? You know real well it was. I think she's a rubber-necked four-flusher. Those prefects are getting very tiring about slaying, said Joey, thoughtfully. I think it's about time we choked them off a bit. Bet actually fined me for saying something was awfully decent. Juliet's just as bad as the rest, put in Rosalie. I'm sure Madame never meant we were to stop saying jolly and decent. Why, Shakespeare used them. Jolly, anyway. A gleam lit up Joey's eyes. What is it, Joey? asked Simone. You're looking funny. An idea, replied her friend. What sort of an idea? Something to down the prefects? Goodness, Margia, what English! If Gisla heard you now, she would have a fit. Oh, let her. Tell us your idea, Joey. Go on. Can't. Tisn't ready yet. I'll tell you when it is. And Joe slipped off to visit Zita and Rufus who by this time had his eyes open and was beginning to stagger about on unsteady legs while his proud mother looked on. After a café that afternoon, she condescended to reveal her idea to the others, and they listened with breathless interest. "'Won't it mean an awful lot of work?' asked Margia doubtfully. "'Well, we'll have to read up a bit, of course,' conceded Joey. "'But it's quite easy, really.' Don't do it if you'd rather not. Joe, don't be silly. Of course I will. We all will. While this was going on, Miss Bettany had opened the fine box and was frowning over the amount in it. It's really disgraceful, she said. The number of fines the middles have is simply appalling. You must do something to stop this silly sling. Put it away with the rest, Gisla. Please. And then we must think of some other punishment, I think. Perhaps if you were to speak to them, madame, suggested Gisla, it is Avenne who is the worst. She speaks so much that seems ugly. All slang is ugly, said the head absently. Some is where some is worse than the rest, of course. I've no wish for you all to talk like the heroines of goody goody books, but at the same time, there is a line to be drawn somewhere, and I draw it at expressions like gum swizzled and Jim Dandy. Yes, said Gisa. Then she added unexpectedly, Madame, what is rubberneck? Miss Bettany gasped. My dear Gisla, I heard one of the juniors talking, ah oh, no, saying it to another. The head got to her feet. I'm going to put a stop to this once and for all. I will not have the babies using such expressions. Please go and assemble the seniors and the middles in the big classroom at once. Gisla fled, and ten minutes later the school was assembled and waiting to know what it was that Miss Bettany had to say to them. They hadn't long to wait. Three minutes after the last of the middles had been hauled away from their private affairs and hunted into the big classroom, the head appeared and read them all a lecture on the inquieties of slang that left them gasping and breathless. I will not allow it, she said, and wound up her talk. You can surely speak English without descending to use ugly, meaningless slang phrases. At any rate, they are strictly forbidden. Please understand that I shall punish most severely any girl who is reported to me for using slang. Then she left them and went over to La Petite Chalet to impress on the juniors the evils of such expressions as rubberneck. The middles clustered together in a corner to discuss the affair, while the prefects went off to their own room, and the other seniors resented, uh, retreated to the little form room.
It had taken the younger members of what was unofficially known as the Big School nearly all the term to become a united body. The difference of their nationalities had had something to do with it, also their want of a common tongue. Many of the new girls found English terribly difficult, and Rosalie and Evan Dean were still unable to carry on a conversation of any length in either French or German. Joe found other languages easy, and her three tongues were the envy of the others. She could even chatter in Italian now, for she had persuaded Vanna and Bianca to talk to her whenever it was permissible in Italian. It was natural, therefore, that she should be the leader of the middles. Now they gathered round her to hear what she proposed doing. We are going to speak good English, she said slowly. Well, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. Shakespeare spoke very good English. Of course, lots of it is rather out of date now. Still, we can't go wrong if we copy him. The English girl saw the point of her remarks at once, and as soon as it had been carefully explained to the others, they saw too. But Joey... How shall we do it? asked Simone. I only know so little of Shakespeare. We'll read all we can, said Joey. Whenever we get a chance, we'll talk to each other. But mind, no one says a word till I tell you. We don't want to let the others know before we're absolutely ready. And then I want to burst it on them like, like a hurricane, sort of. For the rest of that week, the middles were surprisingly quiet and studious for them. Gisela, under the impression that it was the result of the head's lecture, was quite jubilant about it. There was very few fines, and all seemed to be going well. Saturday was a wild, stormy day, with tearing gale from the northwest and a heavy gray sky. Bernhilda, the weather-wise, declared that if the wind shifted to the north, the snow would come. It was later this year, then, it had been last, and when it came, it would probably be a regular blizzard. The wind was blowing too heavily for anyone to go out, and the mistress and prefects prepared for a strenuous day. They need not have worried. Every one of the eleven people who were responsible for most of the mischief going on in the school read nearly whole nearly the whole day and sunday was the same the great surprise was to begin on monday and everyone wanted to know as much shakespearean english as possible before then in the yellow room joey still had one of the window cubicles juliet a head of the dormitory had the other in between came Evandine and Gertrude, Rosalie and Vanna. It was the usual thing for one of the door people to ask Joey what the weather was like when they first woke, and Juliet had got so accustomed to that question that she never paid any heed to it. So this morning, when she heard a rustling from Paula's cubicle, she merely snuggled sleepily down under her bedding after a glance at her watch. The next minute she was widely awake, for instead of the usual, Joey, Joey, what's it like outside? Paula had remarked slowly and distinctly. Joey, please tell me, whence doth it rain? And Joey had replied, Nay, but I'll warrant me, twill come down yet ere the nightfall. A smothered giggle came from Luigi's direction, followed by, Mayhaps tis time we were arising, then Joey. Preteeth, fair Juliet, shall we not arise? Just then the bell rang, and five separate bumps told her that her dormitory was up, a fact which gave her further cause for wonder, since, as a result, there were groans when getting up time came. Mary, how dark it is, observed Rosalie. In smooth, the night hath not given place today. Lights ho. In response, Paula switched on the electric lights, and then a scurry of feet 
so told the senior that the first two girls were making for the bathroom. She was longing to get down to the other prefects to discuss things with them, but she had to wait until the last junior had flung up her curtains over the rod and stripped her bedding. Then leaving them to wedge open the door, she sped down to the big classroom, where Gisla, Bernhilda, and Wanda von Exnu were standing round the huge porcelain stove, warming themselves by the heat. She poured out her tale to them amid their exclamations, and then demanded their opinion. "'I think we will wait and see what they will do,' said Gisla, in her careful English. "'At least it is not slang.' "'No, it isn't slang,' agreed Juliet. "'But it sounds so odd.' The door banged open at that moment, and Frida and Simone, who slept over at La Petite Chalet, came racing in. "'Good morning,' said Gisla pleasantly. "'Good good morrow, sweeting,' replied Simone rather nervously. Gisla could scarcely believe her ears, and she received a further shock, for just then the members of the yellow room, with Maria, entered, and Joey, who was a little in advance of the rest, cried, "'Well met, Gisla.' "'How is it with thee, sweet Chuck?' Juliet gurgled. She really couldn't help it. "'Joey!' exclaimed Isa. "'You must not use slang.' "'Nor did I, pretty mistress,' replied Jo, her black eyes dancing wickedly. "'Surely, sweet ch Chuck is slang,' exclaimed Gisla, stumbling slightly over the unusual term. "'Nay, tis the English of William Shakespeare,' responded Joe naughtily. Gisla had nothing to reply to that, and as the bell for morning breakfast rang just then, they all filed into the spee cell in silence. When they had sat down, Simone passed Frida the roll, saying, Come, fall too, and Frida accepted, saying with a giggle, I thank thee, and be blessed for your good comfort. Miss Maynard, who was at the head of the table, raised her eyebrows, but said nothing. Meanwhile, Evandine, at the other table, turned to Bernhilda and said, "'How thinkest thou, gentle Bernhilda, will it snow?' Bernhilda, dumbfounded at this unusual mode of address, said nothing. There really was little that could be said. Miss Bettany t had told them to read the classics and see how little slang was used there, and try to not model their own speech on these slangs. The Middles had taken her at her word and were modeling their language on the classics. They had only gone rather further back than she had intended. Miss Maynard was thoughtful through the meal. The headmistress was not there. She had wakened up with a violent she had wakened up with a violent headache and had had to stay in bed for the present. Joe glanced round, had just realized that her sister was absent and was wondering uneasily what was wrong. She was recalled to herself by Margia, who leant across the table, remarking sweetly, How now, thou dreamest, where lies your grief? Margia, sit up, said Miss Maynard authoritatively. You must not lean forward like that. I crave pardon, madame, replied Margia. A gasp went round the table, but the mistress took no further notice of it than to say, Go on with your meal. Conversation rather languished after that, and the others wanted Joe to give them a lead, but Joe was worrying over her sister's absence and never opened her mouth. As soon as the meal was over, she dashed off upstairs to the little room on the second landing where, Mar where Madge slept and tapped gently on the door. "'Is that you, Joey?' asked Miss Bettany. "'You can come in for a minute.' Joey stole in and came over to the bed. "'What's wrong, Madge?' "'Just a headache,' replied her sister wearily. "'Oh, it's better than it was, so you needn't look so scared.' "'Would you like some tea?' Joey asked softly. "'No, nothing, thanks. "'I've had some and some aspirin, and I shall go to sleep, I think. "'Run downstairs now, Joey,' she murmured. "'Tell Miss Maynard not to worry. I shall be quite all right.' 
You can come up and see me if I'm awake at eleven if you like. Don't tap, just come straight in. Bye for the present. She stretched out a slender hand and squeezed Joey's, and she settled back. Her small sister went quietly out of the room to find Miss Maynard and give her the message. The other middles found her decidedly quite dull. It was such an unusual thing for Madge to be poorly that Jo felt scared. She adored her sister, though wild horses wouldn't have dragged it out of her. And she felt rather miserable. Bernhilda and Gisla understood, took her off with them when they went over to La Petite Chalet to explain things to Mademoiselle, so that the others might not bother her with questions. Luckily, when eleven o'clock came, Jo found her sister sleeping quietly and went downstairs much relieved. To café at four o'clock brought a message to her from the study, where Madge, her headache completely gone, sat waiting for her. Jo went into the room rather apprehensively. "'You goose!' laughed Miss Bettany. "'You look scared out of your existence!' "'I was,' returned Joey truthfully. "'It isn't often you're ill, you know.' "'No, I know that. "'But I can't help having a headache now and then. "'Now you know how I feel when there's anything wrong with you, "'so perhaps you'll try to avoid doing mad things that give you colds.' "'I haven't had one cold all this year,' cried Joey in injured tones. "'I know. I'm only warning you. "'Now sit down and pour out the tea, will you?' "'Well, rather,' Joey had a joyful hour with her sister, "'and then went back to the others in high spirits. "'Gisa came over to her at once. "'How is Madame?' she asked. "'Nearly all right, thanks awfully,' replied Jo. "'I'm so glad,' returned Gisa. "'We don't like it when Madame is ill.' "'Then she went to the middles and her own quarters.' where she was promptly seized on by the others, who demanded to know how Madame was. "'I'm glad she's better,' said Simone. "'It has been so trite all day.' "'In sooth, it rather hath been a weary length,' returned Joey, suddenly remembering their plans. "'I pray you, tell me, doth it yet snow?' "'Nay, damsel, but the wind is howling much,' replied Evandine promptly. The spirits of all the middles had gone up with a bound. How they managed to get through prep without any trouble was a mystery. After prep, Ben Hilda appeared to say that there would be no dancing that night, but they were all to get their sewing, and Miss Durant had offered to read aloud to them. Woe is me, sighed Joe. I cannot stomach sewing, Ben Hilda gasped. Will you all please hurry, she said when she had recovered her breath. Then she left them. "'I'll warrant me I startled her full sure,' replied Joey in a laugh. She got out her much-abused petticoat. "'Oh, dear, how I hate sewing!' Work in hand, they trotted off to the big schoolroom, where they found the others ready, waiting for Miss Durant, who happened to be late. "'Here's snip and nip and cut and slish and slash.' quoted Mardia as she shook out her sewing. Away, thou rag, retorted Jo as she sat down. Then she turned to Bernhilda. What sweeting all a mort. Joey, be quiet, said Gisla, and please do not use such language. I am sure Madame would not like it. Nay, this to me, retorted Jo. Thou very plenty, knave. Josephine, said a quiet voice behind her. Jo turned round in dismay. There stood her sister. When I told you to model your language on that of the classics, said Madge, I never meant you to use Shakespearean expressions, and you know it. Eleven people looked down, their cheeks scarlet. Miss Bettany survived, surveyed them. A little smile twitched at the corners of her mouth. Please don't do it again, she said, and then left them. I suppose it was your plan, Joey, she said later to her small sister, who had come to say good night to her. Oh, don't be cross, pleaded Joey. We spent ages reading Shakespeare, and now it's been nearly all wasted. And serves you right, was the answer. Joey looked at her doubtfully. 
"'We know a lot more about him anyway,' she said irreverently, "'and it's awfully hard not to be able to say jolly and decent and awful. "'Really it is, Madge, and Shakespeare used such gorgeous words.' "'Madge gave it up and laughed. "'Go to bed,' she said. "'I won't use Shakespearean expressions any more,' promised Joey. "'And we may say jolly and things like that, mayn't we? "'Good night, you baby,' was the only reply she got. However, as the prefects relaxed their vigilance a little, the middles thought it was fairly safe to take it for granted that Miss Bettany did not mind a little slang, so their Shakespearean studies had not been in vain. Chapter 10. An Honor for the Chalet School Next day the snow came, and with it winter. All that day and the next it snowed, a huge whirling blizzard, and the clouds were so heavy that they seemed to be laying on the mountain tops, and still the snow fell. On the Thursday there was a lull, which lasted for two hours, and the girls, well wrapped up, played about the chalet during the whole time. As Miss Bettany said, they would have to take advantage of fine weather when they could. So from ten o'clock until twelve they rushed out in that dry powdery white, which was so unlike English snow and had a glorious time. Just before twelve, the great flakes began drifting down again, and they had to go in. And then once more everything was veiled in whirling white, and the blizzard raged until the Sunday. When the girls got up in the morning, the wind had gone down, the snow had ceased to fall, and it was freezing hard. Joey, sitting up in bed, gazing out of the window, gave a cry of ecstasy as she saw the beauty before her. Mountain paths and level grass were thickly covered with a white mantle, against which the lake lay. Still the black beneath its veiling of thin ice. "'Oh, wonderful!' gasped Joey. "'Juliet, wake up! Isn't it glorious?' There was a groan from the other occupants of the dormitory. "'Joey, do be quiet. It's Sunday, and the only day we get to really have a decent time in bed,' complained Juliet. "'I can see it stops snowing without sitting up. It's going to come down again, though. Just look at that sky.' "'How it is cold!' shuddered Gertrude in her own language. "'Joey, does it freeze? I should think it did.' The lake's absolutely black, and the snow looks so white. The members of the yellow room hopped out of bed and dressed as quickly as possible. Downstairs, Simone was waiting in the passage, and Marie, was noted for being a quick dresser, came racing down, too. The three little girls ran to the door and opened it, letting in a rush of icy cold air that made them shiver. Brr! Isn't it cold? gasped Joey. We'll be able to have a walk today. Yes, if it does not snow again, said Simone pessimistically. Here's Frida. Frida, with her long blue cloak pulled tightly round her and her pretty flaxen hair waving loosely over her shoulders, came flying across from La Petite Chalet. Gruscott, she smiled as she reached them. How it freezes! Gruscott, Frida, said Joey. Then, eagerly, I say, you know the weather about here. Do you think it will snow again today, or do you think it will hold off till tonight? Frida looked seriously at the sullen sky and above them. I cannot tell, she replied. The sky is very full of snow, but it freezes, and so no more may fall until the night. There is no wind, of course. If a south or a west wind should rise, then I think we should have much more snow, wet snow. A north wind might bring hail. As long as it does not blow, there will be frost. If the lake freezes, will Madame give permission for skating, Joey? Oh, sure to, replied Joe. How long will it be before the lake bears? Frida shook her head. I do not know. It depends on how long the frost holds and how keen it is. Shall I go and put my cloak away? The bell will be ringing for breakfast. And we shall be rowed for standing here without any coats on, said Joe. They went on, 
shutting the door behind them and ran into the cloakroom just as Miss Bettany came downstairs. Just in time, murmured Joey, under the breath. Coo! It was cold standing there. Let's go and get warm at the stove. They went into the big schoolroom where some of the others were, and presently the bell summoned them to this peace-cell. After breakfast, Miss Bettany told them that she intended arranging for walks that morning. In the meantime, no one was to go outside without a coat, as there was an icy wind getting up. Everyone was overjoyed at the idea of getting out for, after two days' imprisonment. There was a service in the little whitewashed chapel today, so all the Roman Catholics, which meant the greater part of the school, would attend. They remained eight girls. Miss Bettany herself, Miss Maynard, would have a little service of their own. Then they would have a kind of scratch meal and a long walk, having coffee at the usual time and a semi-dinner at seven in the evening. Splendid scheme, declared Margia. Isn't it, Joey? Awfully jolly, agreed Joe, suppressing with difficulty a shiver. She cast a little rueful glance at her sister, who was laughing at something Gisla had been saying. No one knew better than Joe what was going to happen. Oh, how bitterly she regretted those few minutes at that open door without her coat. She had been standing there for such a little time, but she had felt the icy cold grip her, and she hadn't been warm since. There was nothing for it but to tell Madge, and all the laughter would vanish from her face, and the old anxious expression would come back into her brown eyes, and Joe hadn't seen it since April. She shivered violently, and Grizel, standing near, noticed it. Joey, you're shivering, she cried. Whatever is the matter? You can't be cold. The words reached Miss Bettany, and she swung round at once. Joe, aren't you well? I, I'm sorry, said Joe limply. I, I was standing at the door before breakfast. Joey, how could you? You must go to bed at once. Grizel, no, Gisla, run to Marie and ask her for two hot water bottles. Grizel, you can turn on the bath. Come, Joey, come at once. Miss Maynard, please look after the girls, will you? Joey was hurried away into a hot bath. Then she was put into pajamas, heated at the stove, and rolled in a blanket and carried up to Madge's room, where she was tucked into the bed with two hot water bottles and sundry pillows to lift her up to help the breathing that was already becoming difficult. Nearly all her life, her colds had been serious matters, to be dealt with immediately and given no chance to get any hold. The old bronchitis kettle was roused out and set going, and then Madge went over to the window and stood looking out with compressed lips, and a, cro a croak from the bed brought her to it. "'What is it, Joey? Don't try to talk. You will only tire yourself.' Would you like a drink? Yes, please, croaked Joey, but when it came, she gripped her sister's hand. Madge, I'm sorry. Madge held the glass to her lips before answering. All right, she said curtly as she set it down, and then she sat down on the side of the bed and lifted the child up against her shoulder. That easier, old lady? Mademoiselle is hunting up some medicine. "'Shall I ring up Dr. Eric Turt?' Mademoiselle asked her young headmistress. "'It might be well to have him. "'He would come here for love of la petite.' "'Madge nodded. "'Yes, better send. "'We can't afford to take a risk where Joey is concerned. "'Later came the sound of voices as the girls returned from high mass, "'and then the bell ringing for their meal.' Miss Bettany ran down for this, leaving Mademoiselle in charge of the invalid. Joey's breathing was quick and hard, and her cheeks were flushed, and the rising fever came. An unpleasant little cough had developed, too, Mademoiselle readjusting the bronchitis kettle, and saw that the hot water bottles were all they ought to be, 
and she went off in charge of the senior walk. Miss Bettany had brought back with her some calves with jelly, and she had fed it to her small sister, forbidding her to put her arms out of bed. Try to sleep a little, Joey, she said, and when the jelly had vanished, are you comfortable like that with, or do you need a pillow? No, thanks, croaked Joey. She closed her eyes obediently, but sleep wouldn't come. Her chest felt as though there were tight iron bands round it, and a little sharp pain kept stabbing her in the side. She had a strange idea that the walls of the room were closing in on her, and she cried out in sudden fear. Madge, sitting at the window, watching for the doctor, was with her in an instant. "'All right, Joey. It's quite all right.' said the low, sweet voice that Joey loved. Drink this, honey. Joey drank it, cool water and orange juice in it, and then the kettle was attended to again, and breathing became a little easier for a while. Presently, she raised her eyes. It's the pain in my side, she said weakly. An hour later, the doctor arrived. After that, Joe had no very clear idea of what had happened, during the next two or three days, she came to herself later on Tuesday night to find that the horrid tightness in her chest and the pain in her side had vanished, and she was laying down comfortably with only one pillow under her head. A night light was burning on the little table by the window, and on a camp bed lay her sister. Jo lay for a minute or two, pondering matters. Then she made a slight movement and at once Madge sat up, shaking the dark brown curls out of her eyes. Hello, said Joey. What's up? Have I been ill? No, just a warning not to do silly things, replied Madge, as she got up and slipped into her dressing gown. Drink this, Joey, and then go to sleep again. Joey obediently drank what was given her, and then snuggled down. The long lashes fell on her cheeks almost at once. Madge stood for a minute, looking down at her. It had been a narrow shave. Not until that afternoon had the doctor told her that all fear of pneumonia was at the end, and that, given ordinary care, Joey would be herself in another week. It was a tremendous relief, and not the least part of it was that the doctor had assured her that her small sister was much stronger than she had been in the summer, and that he quite thought she would outgrow her childish delicacy. "'That's something pleasant to write to Dick,' she murmured to herself. Her twin brother, who was in the forestry department in India, he will be pleased. She leant over the child again, listening to the soft, even breathing. Then she pulled up the blanket, tucking it in more closely under her chin, and retired to her own bed, where she speedily fell asleep, only awakening when the rising bell sounded. Joey slept through it, and through her sister's dressing. Indeed, she only woke up when her breakfast tray appeared at nine o'clock. Her eyes went to the window. It was a gloriously sunny day, and she could see the mountains opposite arrayed in sparkling robes of snowy white. Isn't it gorgeous, she said. When can I get up, please? Not for a day or two yet, replied her sister, as she wrapped her in a thick woolly shawl and banked her up with more pillows. That's what you get for doing mad things. Joey chuckled. Then she turned wistfully eyes to the delicate face about her. It was all my own fault, she said humbly. Madge nodded gravely as she laid the tray on her knees. Yes, I know, Joey. Do you remember Monday of last week when I had a headache? Joe paused in the act of peeling the top of her egg. Yes, of course. Why? You told me that you were worried. I was horribly worried. How do you think I felt since Sunday? Joey's eyes fell. I didn't think, she murmured. Exactly. I'm not going to preach, but if you could realize all I've suffered since then, I think you'd do all you could to remember. Madge's lips twitched as she spoke. She had had a bad fright and still had not recovered from it. Tender-hearted Joey saw it, and at 
imminent danger of upsetting her tray. She flung her arms round her sister. Madge, I'm a pig. I'll try. Honest. I will. Madge returned the hug heartily. Yes, do, Joey. I shall feel happier about you now you've made that promise. I must go now, but I'll look in at about eleven. Can I see any of the others later on? demanded Joe, still clinging to her sister. Oh, yes, so long as you don't get excited. You, you've forgiven me? Yes. Haven't I said so? Madge paused for a moment. Then she bent down and kissed the little white face. Joey sat back contentedly. That's all right, she said happily. Oh, Madge, I do love you so. And please, couldn't Robin come and see me for a bit? Madge laughed. Yes, I don't think she will excite you. Eat your breakfast, and she shall come up about ten. At ten sharp, the Robin arrived, carefully carrying some jigsaw puzzles. And when Miss Bettany came shortly after eleven, bringing with her the doctor, she found them disputing about the pieces and wrangling joyfully. The doctor smiled when he saw them. I shan't keep my patient much longer, he said. We shall have you back in school next week, Fräulein Joey. Good, said Joey contentedly, and please, when may I get up? He looked at Miss Bettany with a twinkle in his eye. She is impatient. However, it is well, and Das Manchen may arise on Thursday for a few hours. I shall see her on Saturday, and perhaps she may be skating on the Brockau on the following Saturday. Oh, top hole, said Joey. I'm sorry, Madge, but honor bright, it is. And what could Madge do but laugh? 